Hello, friends. I'm Rosie Acosta, your host and guide on this journey to self-discovery and radical love. I've walked a path filled with challenges. Growing up in East LA during the 92 LA riots, it left me searching for meaning, for mentors, for a way to truly understand the purpose of life. But you know what I found? The power of conversation. So I decided to create a space where we can share these conversations with you, our community. And that's how the Radically Loved podcast was born. Join me as we dive into topics like mindfulness, spirituality, self-love, and the keys to overall healthy living. I'm joined by my dear friend, fellow author, producer, and teacher, Tessa Tovar. Hi, I'm Tessa, and I'm grateful to be part of this community because it teaches me so much about what it means to be human. Ever since I was a little one, I was always asking the deeper questions in life. Why are we here? What happens when we are gone? What is the purpose of life? I love this show because I get to ask the questions that cut right to the meaning of life. I've learned that no matter how much we want the path to be clear, it never is. And that is actually part of the beauty that creates a radically loved life. Please do us a favor, share the episodes you love with your friends and leave us a review. Together, we'll learn how to create a life that's truly, deeply, radically loved. Let's begin. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Radically Loved podcast. This is Tessa hosting today. I'm so honored and excited to have a very special guest on the show. We have Christina Kuzmik joining us. Christina is an amazing, prolific writer who's been through quite the journey with her son. Uh, She immigrated from war-torn Croatia and is a world-renowned speaker known for her unique insight and humor on family-related topics. She currently lives with her husband in Southern California, um, but is joining us today from Salt Lake City because she's touring her fabulous new book. Um, and I'm just, I'm wondering how that's going, Christina. How are you? And yeah. I'm absolutely exhausted. Uh, the book's been out about a week from when we're recording this. And I didn't realize how emotionally exhausting it would be because I, I wrote a book before and toured, but this is such a heavy topic and um, it sort of gives Thankfully, it empowers people to open up. And so I'm hearing a lot of stories and yeah, but it's, it's been, it's been really, it's been really good. I'm thankful. Yeah. Oh, I can imagine. It's such a heavy topic. And if you, if you'd like to give a little synopsis of the book, it reminds me um, if anyone listening has read or watched the movie, they made it into a movie, A Beautiful Boy. Um, It's similar, similar vein and storyline and, but absolutely real life. Um, And um, I guess where I'd want to start with that, aside from, you know, you describing the book for listeners who haven't had a chance to pick it up yet, would be the moment you knew your family was in crisis, if there was a single point, or if it just felt like a gradual realization. Yeah, there were many points. um, And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. I think a lot of times parents are a little bit in denial. We're not ready to face the real, real, real truth because it's scary. But um, so the book is about my son's mental health struggles and all the mistakes I made trying to support him. And I just want to say this up front. Not only did I have his input through each chapter so that it's very genuine to his experience and his story, he actually wrote the last chapter. So the reader gets to hear from a mom who's lost and clueless and trying everything and living in fear. And then you actually get to hear from the teen and what he felt when he was struggling and what he needed from me and the things I did that didn't help. Um, But to answer your question, so he was my first. I have three kids. He's my first. I start seeing changes and I was like, okay, these are teenage hormones. I know what this is. I used to work at a high school with kids. I got this, which was one of my first mistakes. I came from a place of assumption instead of a place of curiosity. And then things just started getting worse and worse. And we got him a therapist and things were still getting worse and nothing was helping. Everything I was trying was somehow making things worse. And finally, one day I flat out asked him, have you ever thought about hurting yourself? And he admitted to me that he was suicidal. And that was one of those moments where I was like, wow, this is so much bigger. And then, you know, when 
Medication wasn't an instant cure because a lot of times it takes a lot of time to even find the right medication, adjust and all that. He started numbing with drugs. He started stealing um, pain pills from people. His depression showed up as anger. He would get really violent, punch holes in the walls, scream in my face. I had to call the police at one point. He ended up hospitalized in a psychiatric hospital. It was just a very long road. And sorry, I'm giving you a super long answer here. <laughs> but, Please um, do. But, you know, one of the reasons that Luca, my son, and I wanted to write the book is that even with the best support system, it is an incredibly lonely experience. It's a really lonely experience. And one of the things that makes it so lonely, well, there's a bunch of stuff, but one of it, one of the things is that people don't talk about this because there's so much shame attached, which by the way, my son so boldly writes in his chapter, how I used to feel shame. I feel zero shame now from my mental health struggles. I did not choose these struggles. Just like you wouldn't feel shame if you had diabetes or a heart disease or whatever, right? Why are we feeling shame? The other thing that makes it a really lonely experience is that every time there's progress, at least for us, and I got my hopes up, all of a sudden it felt like we were speeding backwards in reverse in, with failed breaks. It was just like, get my hopes up. Oh my gosh, he's doing better. And then he's not. And then he's doing much better. And then he's doing much worse. And it just gets really hard and you feel like no one can relate. So this is the book that I needed when I was up all night, crying, scared I was going to lose my son, checking on him in the middle of the night to make sure that he was alive in his bed. Um, and I, yeah, I hope it helps other families. Yeah. So I have a million questions for you, but I, I do want to actually tell listeners the title of your book because yes. I neglected to do that thus far. <laughs> It's called I Can Fix This, Lies I Told Myself While Parenting My Struggling Child by Christina Kuzmik. Um, and we are actually recording this in the month of May, which is Mental Health Month, which is such a, I like, I, I love, I love this conversation because there is so much stigma and, and shame attached to it. And I think one of the things that I was realizing as I was reading this book, and anytime I hear a story like this, there seems to be still this um, stigma around therapy. And I, I was always kind of like mystified by that um, as a young adult, because therapy for me was in my family, always this tool that I felt like I had to get me through life. And I just felt like therapy is something that's going to be there for me as a tool to get me through life. And your son actually talks about this in the video where you're interviewing him on YouTube. And I'll share that link in our show notes. Um, but from his point of view, it was punishment for him. And, you know, it was like everything that, the way that he described it, everything that you did to try to help him inter intervene was like a punishment and um, almost sounds like it drove a wedge in, in between the two of you in some ways. And I'm just, I don't really know how to articulate this question, but I guess I'm wondering from the point of view of parenthood, now that you've you know, gone through it and I'm sure it's still evolving and you're still going through it to some extent, but looking back on that time, would you have done anything differently in terms of like the way that you put him through therapy, the way that you talk to him about these things and how would you yeah. maybe have phrased things differently? Sure. So I didn't even realize he saw it as punishment until we were doing that video. And that's why you can even see in the video, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so interesting. So from my perspective, my kid is out of control. Now I'm finding, you know, that he's doing drugs. Now, the, you know, he's getting back. Like I'm seeing all these things. And so in my mind, I'm like, I know there's something beneath this. Let's go to therapy. But the way he saw it was, oh, I'm showing all these behaviors. So my mom's going to punish me by sending me to therapy. I'm thinking of what is the root, but he's just thinking she sees these behaviors. So I definitely would have worded it differently. I would have, first of all, started way earlier. The minute I saw some changes, again, if I'd come from a place of curiosity instead of assumption, I would have sat down and gone, hey, you know, is there someone that maybe you'd be open and talking to that's not me? Because I feel like you're struggling and there's nothing wrong with that. I struggle too. And just sort of like 
And I probably honestly would have also talked more when my kids were little about me going to therapy. I mean, they knew it, but I didn't talk about it in an open way where it was like, oh, I had the best therapy session today and this is what happened. And I think that's really important for us to normalize it from a young age. My youngest is 10. He is not in therapy, but he knows all about it. And he is like, thinks it's the best thing ever. Um, The other big, big mistake I made that I hope no other parent who hears this makes is when we, when he started going to therapy, the first session, the therapist had both of us together. And what I did is, you know, the therapist said, well, tell us what's going on. And what did Christina do? I decided to say everything that was wrong. Well, Luca suddenly is failing classes and he used to be on the honor roll and he's stealing and I found a vape. And so basically therapy for Luca immediately he associated with, oh, this is the place where my mom gets to vent about me and then they'll gang up on me. And instead, what I needed to do and what I eventually did, and it made a world of difference. What I should have done is gone in there and only talked about me. Here is what I'm struggling with. I'm not sure how to best support him. And I think I've made a lot of mistakes. And so I would love help with that. Because with that, not only am I not putting him in a position where he feels attacked in this new place with this new person. But more importantly, I am modeling vulnerability. I am modeling that it's okay to admit we struggle. It's okay to admit that we don't really have all the answers and we make mistakes and we want to apologize for the wrongdoing and we want to grow. That's what he needed. And when I approached therapy that way with him, all of a sudden this kid started opening up. He's, I started seeing changes. You know, his therapist was like, just thrilled with how vulnerable Luca was being. But we parents so often just, we want to fix it. That's why my book is called, I Can Fix This and Other Lies I Told Myself. I thought I'm going to go in there and the therapist needs to know all the behavior in order to help him. No, he didn't. That would have come out eventually. He didn't need to know that. He needed to just see instead of a bad kid, a hurting kid. And I was focused on the stuff that really in the long run doesn't matter that much if you don't deal with the root of the problem. Mm, yeah. I always think about this from the, and I'm not a parent myself necessarily in, in terms of like, I haven't birthed a child, but we do have my nephew who lives with us, who's going to be 23 this year. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, he's lived with us since he was 15. And I've always, my husband and I both have always been really open about therapy with him. I don't see his behavior as, it seems to me, sort of normal, although he does talk about being depressed and lonely sometimes. And when I bring up therapy to him, he's very, very resistant to it. And I don't want to force it on him. But I'm curious if you think from that lens, if there's any other way, you know, we parents who want this to be a tool for our kids, we want it to be normalized in a way that's like not so scary and and not seen as a punishment. How How might we have that conversation initially with with our kids. Again, every family is different. Every kid is different. So what works for one won't work for another, right? But I would highly suggest instead of it being, hey, would you like to try therapy? Or this is what I think you should do saying, hey, we as a family, I would love for us to learn how to support each other better. What if we all saw therapists? And then eventually can turn into individual therapy. But if you start as a group, it's less intimidating. And also this gives you the perfect opportunity to model vulnerability, right? To model being raw, which is really hard for kids and young adults. And then the bigger picture, which is still going to take a lot of work, but this is one of the reasons my son and I talk about this openly, is we have to get rid of the shame. We have to get rid of the shame. Because if my, I use this example a lot, when my kid started feeling pain in his lower abdomen, he came and told me right away. And he didn't say, no, I don't want to see anybody for it. We went to the doctor, he had surgery, it was appendicitis. I posted a picture of him in the hospital because he gave me permission and everyone was like, oh my gosh, I hope he's okay. And then years later, he ends up hospitalized for mental health struggles and the comments are very, very different. They're very Mm -hmm. different, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can all work and we all have to be public about it, and I think it's the only way it changes is that if we all just talk about it publicly, if we get rid of the shame, then us suggesting therapy to a child who is hurting will be the same as now us suggesting to a child a doctor's appointment because whatever is happening physically, right? It shouldn't feel different. And the only reason it feels different is because mental health is looked at as a weakness. There's something wrong with you. Nobody says that stuff when a kid is in physical pain. Nobody says that stuff. But for some reason, if you're in a mental health crisis, immediately it's like a negative thing, something we shouldn't talk about. Even the fact that since this book has come out, 
the thing I've heard the most, and, and my son has too from people, and I know it's, I, we take it with love and we know the intentions are great, but everybody says, you're so brave. You're so brave. Mm-hmm. Nobody said I was brave or my son was brave when I posted a picture of him in the hospital getting his appendix removed. But this is so brave. And I hope I live to see the day when it is not brave to admit. I struggle with depression. I have these thoughts. I have anxiety. I'm bipolar. Whatever it is. Basically saying, I am human. I am a human with human struggles. Let's get to a point where it's not brave. And that's when everybody, I believe, will be way more open to therapy. Mm, Yeah. Do you know if you're getting enough magnesium? Because four out of five Americans aren't. And that's a big problem because magnesium is involved in more than 300 biochemical reactions in your body. Today, I want to talk to you about the most common signs to look for that could indicate your magnesium deficient. Listen carefully to the end because there's a special offer happening and this could be exactly what you need. Okay, here we go. Are you irritable or anxious? Do you struggle with insomnia? Do you experience muscle cramps or twitches? Do you have high blood pressure? Are you sometimes constipated? There are dozens of symptoms of magnesium deficiency. So these are just a few of the most common ones. Now here's what most people don't know. Taking just any magnesium supplement won't solve your problem because most supplements use the cheapest kinds that your body can't use or absorb. That's why I exclusively recommend Magnesium Breakthrough. It's the only full-spectrum magnesium supplement with seven unique forms of magnesium that your body can actually use and absorb. All Bioptimizer supplements are best in class. If for some reason you feel differently, you can get a full refund, no questions asked. They are so confident that they offer 365-day money-back guarantee. Just go to www.bioptimizers.com forward slash radically loved. Use the promo code radically loved 10. You can get gifts with your purchase. You can get two travel size bottles of magnesium breakthrough. Act fast. This is a limited time offer. Go to bioptimizers.com forward slash radically loved and use the promo code radically loved 10. I was curious to hear how you developed such an open and honest conversation with your son about his journey, Um, you know, having gone through it, how did that develop? Or were you, were you always open and honest with him throughout that journey? Or did that develop over time? I was always open and honest. And, you know, one thing he wrote in his chapter of the book is how what helped him a lot is knowing that our home is a place where we can talk about anything and everything. And so from a young age, no matter what he brought up and no matter how uncomfortable it was. And even if I was like, oh my gosh, he's too young to be asking about this. I never shut him down. I always found an age appropriate way. So it was never, we'll talk about it when you're older, never. And so I think that helped a lot and it still helps us because he feels like he can come to me with anything. However, where I messed up was I thought I knew exactly what was happening. The way I write in the book is I was not standing in awe of Luca's story. A lot of times we, as parents, we just make a lot of assumptions and we are the leaders and we know what our kids need and we know how to solve things. And that's the mindset, right? Because a good parent sees a problem and they know how to solve it. And no, a good parent is a student. And the only expert at being Luca is Luca. And I needed to just stand in awe of his story and not have him live whatever story I thought he should be living, but just stand in awe of his story, his pain, his experience, even if, even if it, I didn't always understand it. And so when I made that shift, that's when we really became close. And I mean, he now, you know, he's turning 21 this summer. He just called me the other day and just said, I'm having a really bad day and, you know, opened up about his mental health. And we talked about it so bluntly. And I don't know that we would have that if I didn't stop yapping at him and trying to control him. And also another thing he writes in his chapter is it really didn't help when my mom was coming from a place of fear. Now, how do you not as a parent come from a place of fear when you find out your kid is suicidal? At one point in our journey, the psychiatrist asked us to put all the knives away. So I had knives hidden in the garage locked. And every time I cooked dinner for my kids, I'm crying right now, I had to go get a knife, use it quickly, wash it and go hide it again. You can imagine that as a parent, you are living in fear. You're living in constant fear. 
And even if you're not saying things to your child that sound fearful, they sense your energy. And so I had to learn to sit in my fear, but not allow it to control me, not allow it to make decisions for me. It is not qualified for that job, not to let it lead every conversation. And that's a very, very hard thing to do as a parent. But if I continue just with that, oh my gosh, panic mom mode, you know, puppeteer, I I don't, I don't know that, I don't know that he would be here, honestly, because he needed somebody who was willing to stand in awe of his story. I love that. Standing in awe of his story. Oh, you're making me emotional. So I'm going to try to ask you this next question without <laughs> tearing up myself. Um, the The conversation around drugs, doing drugs, not just doing drugs to numb the pain. Um, but what, what really struck me in your conversation with him was his question to you. If the only thing keeping you alive, mom, was doing drugs, would you do drugs? Um I want to talk about that. I want to hear your perspective on that. Uh, And secondly, I also want to talk about drugs for the sake of regulating um, mental health. And I mean, I don't know what that that part of the story, if at all, or the journey, if at all, um, is in use today. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. So basically, he, you know, again, like I mentioned before, when you know, psychiatric medication, psychotropic medication was an instant cure. He started uh, doing drugs. He, it started with weed, but it was stuff he was getting from school and it was always laced with something and it would really mess him up. In fact, I write in the book how I get a phone call and email from the school one day, everybody got it. It was like an automated thing saying that two girls were, had seizures and were taken to the hospital because they smoked weed that was laced with something. And I afterwards approached him. I was like, oh my gosh, Luca. And he was like, yeah, I get the stuff from the same person. It's not a big deal. Like he, nothing was a big deal. And a lot of parents with teenagers know, mom, you're being dramatic. Nothing's a big deal. And then he started stealing pain pills and there was a lot, but he ends up hospitalized in a psychiatric hospital. And straight from there, he's in a residential program and we're sitting in a therapy session, residential program. And we're, we're much closer now. Therapy has been helpful. His time away has been helpful for him to just focus on his health. And he says to me in this therapy session, hey, mom, I know that one of the problems with our relationship is that I was lying to you and I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be completely honest. And I I just always want to be honest with you. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, look at the progress we're making. This is amazing. And he said, so this is me being honest with you. As soon as I get out of here, I am going to go back to doing drugs. And my heart just sank. And I was like, what is happening right now? I thought we were making progress. Where is this coming from? And so I just stayed calm. And I said, Luca, um, you know, I'm never going to approve of that. I'm not going to approve of you using drugs to numb. And we just kept going back and forth, back and forth. And then all of a sudden he starts sobbing. I mean, shaking, sobbing, the 16 year old boy just sobbing. And he finally said, mom, if the only thing keeping you from killing yourself was being high, would you do drugs? And I was honest with him. And I said, yep, yep. If that was the only thing that would keep me from killing myself, I would but I have to believe there's another way. And it took a while. And I write in the book how he did make a decision eventually to quit everything. And, you know, he doesn't think of himself as an addict. I don't think of it as an addict. I think just like a lot of people, you go through a hard time. I have a friend who went through a divorce and drank too much, right? To deal with the pain. People choose different things. Some people cut, some people gamble. There's, we, we find our poison, right? That we use to numb. But he will tell you himself, he would not have been able to get better if he didn't give up drugs at that point. Everything. He gave up everything at that point. No alcohol, nothing. Because he, he was numbing. And you can't heal if you're numbing. You can't heal. And so he needed to allow himself to feel. And he actually got worse after he stopped because, well, now he doesn't have his quote unquote medicine, right? Now he's even more aggressive. He's more violent. He's more depressed. He's more suicidal. And as a parent, you're like, oh my gosh, what do, what do I do? Do I want the kid on drugs and and at least like somewhat functioning or sober and not functioning? You know, it was just, it was such a crazy roller coaster ride for all of us. Um, but he would say himself, that was a very necessary step he needed to take. 
And I don't, I also want to be really careful and he does too. I don't want to tell anyone else, you know, I, I know there are people who are like, you know what, I use whatever, whether it's a glass of wine or whether it's weed or whatever. And it just helps me. Realize. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm not here to judge all. And we're not here even to give advice. <laughs> we're just here to share our story. Yeah, I think that's a really important note to make. So thank you for saying that. I wanted to go back to something you said prior to this, which was, you know, your thoughts around if I had continued to lead this journey with my son from a place of fear, he might not have made it. Um, So I want to discuss the importance of prioritizing yourself while supporting your child um, and what sort of self-care rituals, routines, tools did you lean on during this journey? And maybe you still do. Yeah. So it's interesting in my first book, Hold On But Don't Hold Still, that came out in 2020, I have an entire chapter called The G-Spot, referring to guilt, not the other G-Spot. And I write in it how I've become great at taking care of myself and not beating myself up and self-care and all that. And I really did. I feel like I've almost mastered being, not feeling any guilty taking care of my, any guilt taking care of myself. But then when my son started struggling, that switched things for me a little bit. And I tell the story in the book, how my 40th birthday was coming up. I was really excited about it. I, I love birthdays. I celebrate my kids half birthdays with half the cake and half the happy birthday song, but I've never had a party for myself. So my husband is like, let's throw you a big party for your 40th birthday. We have it all planned. There's a DJ that's going to be there, a photo booth. People are flying in from out of town. We reserve this beautiful thing. Okay. That's supposed to happen on a Friday. Tuesday before that Friday is the night I had to call the police on my son and he was taken in handcuffs to the ER. Um, Wednesday before that Friday, he's in the ER waiting for a a bed to open in a psychiatric hospital. And I keep coming back to visit him and he keeps screaming at me to get that F out. And Thursday, he's finally in a hospital. So of course I'm going to cancel the party. And I tell him to call every, I tell my husband to call everything off. And my sweet mother-in-law says to me, there are no visiting hours during that time at the hospital. So if you don't have this party, what are you going to do instead? You're just going to sit at home and cry and worry. And she convinces me to go through with this party. And I show up to my party, I dress up and I fake the smiles. And inside I'm just dying because Luca is supposed to be there. And then a friend pulls me onto the dance floor and I just let loose. And I dance and I dance and I dance and I dance. And it feels so good. And right after it feels so good, it feels so bad. Because what kind of a mother throws a party for herself and dances while her son is in a psychiatric hospital wanting to die? I felt so guilty about that. Months later, I'm sitting and talking to one of my best friends, Zach. And I tell him I can't shake this guilt. I just I just cannot believe I went through with that stupid party. And Zach says to me, Christina, you did Luca a favor. He knew how much you love birthdays. He knows how much, he knew how much you were looking forward to this party. And Zach tells me, you know, when I was in high school and I was going through my depression, I was awful to my mom at times. And if on top of everything I put her through, I knew that she canceled something that was important to her, I would carry that guilt still two decades later. By going through at that party, you gave Luca a gift. You gave him one less thing to feel he destroyed. And that just blew my mind because I realized that all this time I was thinking, I'm allowed to be happy when my son is happy. I'm allowed to take care of myself when I'm sure that my son is well taken care of. I'm allowed to enjoy my life once he enjoys his life. And my friend Zach showed me that day that that's a hell of a lot of pressure to put on somebody. And that positive emotion should not be a reward that we have to earn, especially when earning that reward is contingent on circumstances completely out of our control. And so... I took really good care of myself from then on. And I made sure that my needs were just as important to me as my son's needs. It doesn't have to be a competition or comparison. And later on, when I was writing the book, I actually asked Luca, I said, you know, I'm writing about my birthday party. Do you know that I went through with that? And he's like, yeah, I saw pictures and stuff. I'm like, how do you feel about that? He said, mom, I'm so glad you did that. I'm so glad you did that and you deserved it. So I think a lot of times we feel like, Somehow, if our loved ones are suffering, it means we have to suffer. That's the only way we can show empathy and makes us good people. No, our kids need us to take the best care of the most important person in their life. And that's us. That's us. So I took time for myself. I took time with friends. I went to therapy. Um, I just decided that 
I had this rule during that time, the harder the day, the kinder I had to be to myself. And if I knew it was going to be a hard day with him, man, I was the most forgiving to myself. I treated myself like I would treat whoever I adore the most. And that helped Luca. It never took away from him. It helped him. Hmm. Wow. Uh, So calling the cops on your son, um, I think this is something you said in the video and also maybe it's in the book or maybe I'm mixing them up, but I think that was a tool that somebody recommended that you lean on, if I'm remembering correctly. Would you mind talking about that? Yeah. So I can't remember how long before that night when I called the cops on him, Luca got really aggressive with his dad and he was basically mad because we took his drugs away. That was always like what would cause the violent outbursts usually. And he was in a really suicidal state and he ran away and I freaked out. And I had to stay home because I have two little kids who are asleep upstairs. So my husband and a bunch of friends go searching for him and they can't find him anywhere. And I'm just, you know, my mind's going, he's going to hurt himself. He's going to hurt someone else. He's talked about robbing places in order to get drugs. Like he's, you know, finally around 2, 3 a.m. He came home and I talked to his therapist the next day. I said, I don't know how to live like this. I don't know what to do. I feel lost and helpless. And the therapist said, Christina, if you find yourself in that situation again, and he's in danger or he's putting anyone else potential in danger, you've got to call the police. And the night I called the police, things got really out of hand. They got really out of hand. And I... I felt like I had to, I, I felt like I didn't have another choice. And at the time I was like, I don't know if I'm going to regret this. I don't regret it. And in fact, Luca says himself, he needed to be taken and put in a psychiatric hospital. The police was like, they saw the scene because there was a lot of violence and there was glass all over the floor and he had tried cutting himself with the glass and it was, so there's blood on the floor. So they were like, we need to, you need to file charges. And I just decided to trust my gut. I said, my son does not need a punishment right now. He needs help. He needs help. And that psychiatric hold was one of the first steps in really getting him help. Mm. Thank and, you. and by the way, I, I, I wouldn't wish that on any parent. And the one thing I don't want is my book to add any pain to the world. So if you as a parent have a kid who's struggling and you didn't call the cops or you made different decisions than I did, please don't blame yourself because this is out of our control, out of our control. There, there are so many reasons. There are so many mistakes I made that could be the reason that Luca is not here, right? He just happens to still be here. And so much of that was out of my control. So I don't want any parent to listen to anything I'm saying, especially if they've lost a child and go, if I just did that thing she did. No, no, because that wouldn't have necessarily saved your kid. So just want to say that. I don't want to add any pain into the world. Thank you. I wanted to hear more about, I mean, you're kind of maybe speaking to this already, but some parenting myths um, that, you know, you would want other parents to have in their toolkit. Um, are there any Are there any other parenting myths that you want to call out? Sure. I mean, we just talked about good mothers are selfless. I hate that one. Selfless means having no concern for self. Um, Also, you know, I was raised where a parent is a leader and they make decisions and they know how to fix everything. And what I realized is that that attitude caused so much self-hatred for myself because if you think you can control something, then when things don't work out the way you want it, guess whose fault it is? It's your fault because you were supposed to know how to control it. And what I realized is that I needed to connect more than control. I thought I could do both. You can't. You cannot control and connect at the same time. And I get that the fear and all of that and pressure from society, you know, a good mother wouldn't have a kid talk to her like that. And a good mother wouldn't have her kid, you know, hauled off by the police. And like all that pressure and judgment puts us in this mode of like, I need to figure this out and fix it. And it wasn't until I stopped trying to fix him and worked on fixing the unhealed parts of myself I was bringing into parenting and focusing on just connecting with them and standing in all the story that things really started to shift. So I would start asking myself, instead of what can I do for Luca? Who can I be for him? And I think that's a really important part of parenting. And now even, you know, he's doing better every day. I will still, even when now I'm on the road, I'll text him, I'll ask him, 
is there anything I can help? Is there anything I can do to support you today, basically? And to me, it's a way of telling him, I don't know. I want to learn. I want to stand in awe of your story. I want you, if you're comfortable, to share with me what I can do. Let me be a student. Let me learn how to support you. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, so the, the ethos of this podcast, Radically Loved, is the idea that we are all radically loved in some way by some source of our understanding, some higher source of our understanding, whether that be something we call God or spirit or nothing or the black hole, you know, whatever it is. And Rosie will often ask a two-part question about, you know, how do you feel radically loved and, or what do you radically loved? So I'd love to hear you answer that question. Um, and then I'll have a follow-up question to that. It's interesting you asked this because just the other day I asked my 10 year old, he's my youngest. I said, what does it feel like to be loved by me? And he said, safe, like I'm wrapped in a cozy quilt. And I got really teary eyed because to me, true love feels so safe, not just safe from harm and hurt and pain and all that, but safe as in I am accepting you and you're accepting me in our full authenticity. No expectations, no, you know, judgments or preconceived ideas. I'm accepting you in your authenticity, flawed and as messy and all of it that it is. And so that's sort of how I feel loved and hope that I am loving my family and also loving myself in that way. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. And I mean, to me, that's, that is unconditional love, right? That is the love that is safe and it's non-judgmental and it's there regardless. I mean, you really demonstrate that with your story with your son, that the love is there regardless of the actions and behaviors. I get this contract from Penguin Random House, my publisher, to write this book and I sign it and I start writing and I am a mess. I am crying. I am not sleeping at night because I'm having to relive all of these stories. And I'm in therapy session with my therapist. And I said to him, you know, I'm going to try to get out of this contract. This was a mistake. Why? We went through hell. Why now? We're finally in a better spot. Why would I want to relive all that? Like, it's really messing with my sleep and I'm crying all day. It's just, it's not good for me. And he looked at me and he said, Christina, you're writing a love story. This is a love story between a mother and a son. And everything just suddenly made sense. And I realized that even on, not just even on us, especially on the hardest days within the most painful, fear-filled, awful days. It's a love story. It was a love story. And so that's what made me decide to actually go through with it and write a book. And I end the book, spoiler alert, with saying, you know, it's a love story. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you for adding that. Oh, Christina, oh, I cannot stop um, crying. You are just... <laughs> Oh, thank you for this. Um, it's very quite actually cathartic. I think it's such an important conversation to have as a society over and over again, as many times as we need to, to um, reduce the stigma, reduce the shame. And hopefully eventually <laughs> there isn't shame when we're talking about mental health. And like you said, that it's not considered this brave thing, but it's just considered like, this is something that I have that's a tool that I use as a resource, just like I would go to see my healthcare practitioner for any sort of malady. And if any of your listeners have, you know, a child who's like teens or even young adult who feels shame about their mental health or feels weird or whatever, even if you don't buy the book, get it at the library or wherever and just have the kid, again, it doesn't have to be a kid. It could be a person in their twenties, whatever. Um, read my son's chapter because I got a message the other day, I could cry, from a mom who said that her daughter just was, just felt misunderstood and she was isolating. And all of a sudden she walked in the living room and saw her daughter reading my son's chapter. And after she read it, they had like this amazing, sorry, they had this amazing conversation because she just felt like somebody finally understood and, and said what was in her head. And so that's really the point of the book, right? And that my son is a very private person. He doesn't even use social media. So when I asked him, why are you willing to do this? And he said, because I don't want anyone to feel alone. 
And if it helps any of your kids or even adults who are struggling, if it helps you feel less alone, then that's the reason he did it. He wrote about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saying that. Actually, I was going to ask you that. So I'm glad you, you brought that up because it is such a vulnerable thing to share, uh, especially for a young person who is going through something like anxiety and depression and being willing to share that, that journey is, I think it just shines a light on so much that we need to hear. And yeah, and I think that conversations like this and your story just open the door for other others to feel like they're not alone. And you're right, it is. You don't have to be a child. You don't have to even be in your 20s. You can be in your 30s and 40s and still be struggling with this stuff. I mean, I know for me personally, I just returned to therapy again last week. I had my first therapy session with a new therapist. And I don't know what the heck I was waiting so long for. It's been... Mm, I want to say like four, four years since COVID. Um, and it's such a cathartic tool. It's not just cathartic. It's just, we can't do this on our own. You know, just like I'm not going to do surgery on myself. If I need to have surgery, I need a professional to help me with that. And I'm not going to struggle through this and I'm not going to white knuckle my way through this anymore. I, I'm going to say I need help. I need support. And by the way, what a beautiful show of strength. Like to me, asking for help is one of the most empowering, strongest, powerful things we can do. And I'm so tired of people looking at it as a weakness. It's not a weakness. It's actually really powerful to say, hey, I need help and I'm going to get help because I deserve it. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. That's not weak. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So once again, the title of Christina's book is I Can Fix This, Lies I Told Myself While Parenting My Struggling Child. Um, I believe it's available wherever books are sold, correct, Christina? Yes. yes. Is there anything else that you want to share that I didn't ask you anything that you would have hoped to be able to talk about? I mean, I just hope that every family who's struggling is... Let me. Can I finish with a quick story? It's just easier yeah, for me. Please. Talking stories. Yes, of course. This is what I want for every family. So I'm at a Trader Joe's parking lot a few years ago. This woman runs up to me, Christina, Christina, and I recognize her as somebody I knew years ago. Our sons went to elementary school together. I hadn't seen her since. And she starts talking to me. We're catching up. And she goes, oh my gosh, can you believe our boys are graduating? And we're trying to figure out what to have a big graduation party or small family thing. What are you going to do for Luca? And everything inside me wanted to do what I would have done years ago and just give some vague answer. I don't know. We haven't figured it out. But I decided to meet that moment with ease and with truth. And I said, Luca is not graduating. And she immediately looked flustered and embarrassed. And I was like, no, 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 it's good. He's had a lot of mental health struggles. He's working on them. That's the priority. And I'm really proud of him. And I hope he's proud of himself too. That's what I wish for everyone. Because I cannot tell you how amazing and freeing it felt to just stand in our truth, to stand in our truth and not worry, what will people think and will we be judged and just to stand in our truth. And it made me realize I'm very much okay with our messy, imperfect, flawed, complicated story. And so is my son. And by the way, five months later, he completed his coursework. I threw him a surprise ceremony at our house. I ordered a cap and gown on Amazon. He never thought he would wear one. And you know, I, what I told him that night is I, this is really important to celebrate because this is not embarrassing. You did not graduate five months late. You graduated on time, your time. And so that's my wish for every family and everybody who's struggling. Be okay in standing in your raw, messy story. And the people who have a problem with it, the reason they have a problem with it, the reason they're judging you is because they're not comfortable enough standing in their true story. So how dare you? How dare you? But you know what? Hopefully if we can all just do that more, it will spread and we'll get rid of the shame. Yeah. I think the more we practice standing in our truth, the just like anything we do, you know, this the more we practice it, the stronger that flexing of that muscle becomes, the deeper that neural pathway becomes, the easier it gets. And I'm not saying it will be easy, but that muscle is more likely to flex when it's had the practice. Yes. And it's the best, most freeing. I mean, it's been the best thing for my mental health and my son's mental health is going, we don't, we're, there's nothing to hide here. 
We don't have these like, you know, secrets and oh, nobody can know this stuff about our family. Like just living in our truth is one of the healthiest thing you can do for your mental health. Yeah. Christina, I could sit here and talk to you all day. I'm so inspired by your story. Thank you for sharing it with us and your son, Luca, too. Thank you so much for that raw vulnerability. Uh, thank you for shining a light on a topic that's been too long in the dark. Um, and I really hope that everyone listening is inspired to start to practice speaking your truth and seeking the help you need without shame. Uh, thank you so much, Christina. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Hey friends, thank you so much for listening to the Radically Love podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. It really helps. Also, don't forget to check out the Mindful Love Hub on Substack. This episode was produced by Tessa Tovar, music by DJ Taz Rashid. 